Good morning. Welcome to Calvary Chapel, uh, Southern Vermont. Today we're going to be going through the book of Galatians. And what I thought I'd do is just kind of do an overview of the book so we all get a taste of what's going on uh, in it before we start it next week. So with that, I'll just open up in prayer. Father, thank you for this time you've given us to be together as a fellowship, Lord. I pray, Lord, that your word would go forth and accomplish its purpose in every heart that hears it. I ask for the softening and the leading of the Holy Spirit upon every heart that's listening right now, Lord, that, uh, that your word would, would uh, be brought to the center of every being, would reveal your Son as Lord and Savior, would reveal the hope that heaven offers us through him. Father, by your grace, lead us through your word, I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Book of Galatians. Uh, so in this overview of the book of Galatians, we're going to kind of walk through the history a little bit of the book of Galatians, the title, the background, the author, the date of writing, and the theme and the message of the book. Um, and I think it's important of our understanding of what God is saying to us through the Apostle Paul and what Paul is trying to get through to the believers in Galatia. Um, so the history of the book, probably over the last 2,000 years, the book of Galatians has made an enormous or a huge impact on every single era of church history thus far. When you read back and you can read back at some of the earliest expositions of the Bible, um, it's been the book of Galatians that's been exposited on. When you read the life of Origen in 230 A.D. or Severus in 360 A.D., Christendom in 407 A.D., they all wrote famous expositions of the book of Galatians, and you can still find them. Uh, they're still recorded and in print, and you can read them today. During the Middle Ages, at a time when the gospel was almost completely eclipsed, Thomas Aquinas preached a powerful exposition of the book of Galatians, which brought forth a revival that moved through the dark ages, carrying the light of the gospel to many, many souls. The Protestant Reformation was born from Martin Luther's study of the book of Romans and Galatians, and it would be the book of Galatians that would have its very special and unique place in Reformation history. It's actually, uh, the book of Galatians got its nickname during that time of the Magna Carta of Christian freedom, and it was sometimes referred to as the cornerstone of the Protestant Reformation. It was Martin Luther who would preach verse by verse through the book of Galatians twice, and he also wrote two commentaries on the book, one in 1519, and then again the other in 1535. And he was questioned, why did you write two commentaries in the book of Galatians? He said, so that Satan couldn't steal away the true gospel from the hearts of the people. And those can both still be read today. Martin Luther was quoted many times saying that he had two wives, one Catherine von Bora, the other one was the book of Galatians. Martin Luther changed the direction of the known Catholic world by preaching justification by faith in Christ alone. And as we sit here today and, and read and walk through an exposition of the book of Galatians, um, we're the believers that are, that are coming off those heels of these men uh, that were touched and moved by this word of God. The title of the book of Galatians, it's the letter of Paul to the Galatians. Now, in Acts chapter 14, Paul spent some time going through the areas of Lyconium and Lystra and Derbe. Those are the churches of Galatia. If you turn to the back of your Bible, you know, sometimes you have a Bible map like this, and it has Galatia up here in the northern area. 
but just below Galatia, you're going to see uh, Lyconia and Lystra and Derbe, and that's where Paul went. It was the southern region of Galatia that he was reaching. In the, in the background of this book, pretty much, you know, these churches in Lyconium, the churches that were in Lystra and Derbe, were full of brand new believers. Now, most of them were Gentile believers who were not accustomed to the Jewish history or faith. They were simply men and women who received the gospel and became followers of Jesus Christ. And as Paul continued to press on westward, sharing the gospel in many other regions, many Jewish men called Judaizers, men who had believed on Jesus as the Messiah, but taught that to continue to be saved, you must adhere to the works of the law and to many of the Jewish ceremonial teachings. Teachings, And what Paul's doing here is he's writing this letter to refute what these Judaizers were teaching the churches in Galatia. In fact, in Galatians 1, uh, 6 through 10, Paul says, I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, which is really not another, only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we've, we've preached to you, he is to be accursed. And as we have said before, and I say again, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you received from us, he's to be accursed. I mean, Paul hit it right on the head. He wasn't playing games with what the Judaizers were doing to the churches in Galatia. Now, the time and date of this book was roughly between 48 and 50 A.D. The book of Galatians is the first letter that Paul ever wrote in a, into a New Testament church, um, and it was actually the second letter written in the whole New Testament, the first being the book of James, um, the second being the book of Galatians. And it's pretty amazing because James, when he writes his book, um, he's writing to uh, exposit how faith without works is dead, and he's speaking to the Jewish believers in Jerusalem. When Paul writes the book of Galatians, he's speaking to Gentile believers in Galatia, and he's letting them know, he's trying to exposit how that faith in Christ alone is true salvation, and that true salvation produces works that glorify God. As Paul comes into this message that he has. There's a theme in this book, and there's a message behind all that what he's saying. I guess you could say, I would say, that the book of Galatians is pretty much a full commentary on the book of Deuteronomy. If you ever want to know where you stand with God, with the law, read the book of Deuteronomy, and you'll find out that living by the law will only make you proud and reveal in your life your desperate need to cry out to God for help. See, the book of Deuteronomy proves that man cannot keep the law of God and, 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 and man cannot in his own ability stay pure before God's holy standards. When Jesus came into this world, he taught that he himself will fulfill the law, and he did when he died on the cross and rose again from the dead. He became the fulfilled law of God that mankind could now, by faith in Christ alone, walk out a life that pleases God. And Paul is sharing this truth to the churches in Galatia, that the law of God is now fulfilled in Christ in me. And that's what allows me to live a holy and pure life before God this day. There are some who argue that um, the Galatians is a book in which Paul defends his own ministry, but it's actually really far from that. It's Paul's great defense of the true gospel, which would be salvation alone by faith in Christ and sanctification alone by faith in Christ. And Paul fully understood what a legalistic Pharisee that he used to be. If you remember, we read in the book of Acts when Paul was Saul and he began to destroy the church of God. Uh, Paul fully understood what legalism did to a religious person's life. But he also now, as a follower of Jesus Christ, he fully understood what the grace of God did to him by his faith in Christ alone. 
He's defending the true gospel, which is faith in Christ alone, and he's warning the believers in Galatia to return to it. They had turned from the true gospel to a false gospel of works. Again, the Judaizers had come in. They taught a works-based salvation and a works-based sanctification, something like faith in Christ equals salvation, but to retain salvation, which would be sanctification, works are required. And Paul's saying, no way. In fact, Paul writes in Galatians 2, uh, verse 16, he says, Nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus, even we have believed in Christ Jesus so that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, since by the works of the law no flesh will be justified. What Paul is saying, it's salvation by faith alone in Jesus Christ, and it is by faith alone in Christ that sanctification is accomplished. That means God's working in me and then through me to accomplish his purposes. Now, if I'm striving to make myself good as well as that is to any good Christian life, I'm still striving to be holy and to make myself turn from darkness. It's still a works-based salvation. It's by faith in Christ I'm saved, and by faith in Christ I'm being sanctified. Then my holiness and my purity is changed by him on my inside, which will truly affect then what's going on on my outside. That's why Paul would write in Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 and 8, he says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he also will reap. For he sowing to his flesh will reap corruption from the flesh, but he sowing to the Spirit will reap everlasting from the Spirit. So, so you learn from Galatians, or what to learn from even Deuteronomy. I can't keep God's laws. I'll never be good enough to do it. I must be born again so the law of God can be fulfilled by Christ in me, and that is the only way for my perfection. Christ in me, the hope of glory, is the only way I can be perfect before God. I cannot do it of my own merit. It will never happen. And that's really the theme and the message behind what Paul's pressing to the churches in Galatia. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 19, we're told, for, the, for by the law nothing will be made perfect. In Romans 3, 20, we're told, therefore, no human being will be justified in God's sight by the means of works prescribed by the law. For through the law comes the full knowledge of sin. In Romans chapter 4, verse 13, says, For the promise that he would inherit, talking about Abraham, the world did not come to Abraham or his descendants through the law, but through the righteousness produced by faith. In Romans chapter 5, verse 1, we're told, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. In Romans chapter 6, verse 12 through 14, uh, Paul writes to the church in Rome, Therefore do not let sin rule in your mortal body so that you obey their desires. Stop offering the parts of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness. Instead, offer yourself to God as people who have been brought back from death to life and the parts of your body as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin will not have mastery over you because you're not under the law, but you're under grace. And that's really the pressing that Paul gives. He's going to write in Galatians uh, chapter 5. I'm going to read it to you. Verse 1, he says, It was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, do not keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. In verse 4 of chapter 5, You have been severed from Christ, you who are seeking to be justified by the law. You have fallen from grace. For we, through the Spirit, by faith, are waiting for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ is neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything, but faith working through love. In verse 13 through 15 of chapter 5 of Galatians, Paul says, For you were called to freedom, brethren. 
Only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, in this statement, you shall love your neighbor and yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, take care that you're not consumed by one another. You know, what, what Paul is showing here is that when true sanctification by faith in Christ is happening in a believer's life, it's going to be seen in their love for their brethren, not in their personal holiness, just as Jesus taught his disciples. In Galatians 6, 2, Paul says, Bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. And what Paul's showing there, it's our concern and care and love for one another that proves that Christ is at work in me. The proof I'm being sanctified by Christ and not myself is a true love for the brethren and that the labor for God that's, that's mixed in with that. Paul wanted the believers in Galatia to understand that through the Judaizers, the churches had been taken captive and tantalized. They had been teased by some hope of coming good from God because of keeping Jewish law and ceremony. And Paul is trying to say that's not true. The Judaizers had been led, had led the believers astray by a false gospel of works, which a false gospel of works only tantalizes their flesh. And that's an amazing thing. I'm going to picture here you in the gospels in Matthew chapter 4, verse 18 and 19, uh, it says, In walking by the Sea of Galilee, Jesus saw two brothers, Simon, called Peter, and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Now the emphasis in that statement is, I will make you fishers of men. That speaks of sanctification. I will make you what I'm going to make you. I will make you what I've called you to be, what my Father's called you to be. I will make you. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, you know these verses well. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke on you and learn from me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden and light. And the emphasis here in these scriptures is come to me. That's what Jesus is saying. Come to me and you'll find rest for your souls. And again, this is something only Jesus can do for a human soul. It speaks of salvation and it speaks of sanctification. Only Jesus can save my soul and only Jesus can make me into his image, make me into the image that God has created me to be for his glory. In John chapter 16, when Jesus is, is talking in, uh, about the Holy Spirit, uh, verses 12 through 15, he says, I have yet many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatever he hears, he shall speak, and he will announce to you things to come, and he will glorify me, and he will receive of mine and will announce it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore I said that he will take of mine and will announce it to you. And the emphasis in these scriptures is that the Holy Spirit will never lead you into bondage. The Holy Spirit will never lead you into a carnal bondage or a religious bondage that's done by yourself because of your own fleshly desires. The Holy Spirit will always lead you to Jesus, to what is His, and this is His. What? Light, not darkness. So in this whole book of Galatians, Paul is expressing his, the true heart of a servant of God here when he writes back to these churches in, in Lyconium and Lystra and Derby, and he writes back to them and he's letting them know you've been taken captive by a false gospel and by false teachers. Get back on the track that God has called you to walk, which is faith in Christ alone. So Galatians is all about salvation by faith in Christ alone and sanctification by faith in Christ alone. And my goal really 
is that you might take some time and every week takes about 30 minutes, read the whole book of Galatians. And then if you know we're in chapter 1, on Saturday, spend some time in, in the chapter that we're going to be walking through and expositing through so that we all might hear the Lord together. But I believe that Galatians is a book that everyone who calls himself a follower of Jesus Christ needs to spend some serious time in to look to make sure that salvation has truly happened in your heart, that sanctification is truly happening by the hand of God and not by your own works. So as we walk through the book of Galatians, my prayer for you is this is first, that you are truly saved by faith alone in Christ and that you're truly being sanctified by faith alone in Christ, that you may be set free from the slavery of carnality, from the bondage of legalism, that you might be set free to love the brethren and to serve the Lord with gladness and joy. So that's my overview of the book of Galatians. I know it's short today, but I would suggest to you, take some time, dig into the book of Galatians. There's a lot of life here. There's a lot of hope in this book, and there's a lot of grace that's been given to you and I. Uh, we're going to be looking at the gospel of Jesus Christ and, and where that sits uh, as we go through. So that's our overview on Galatians. Amen? Amen. Well, God bless you all. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would take this simple word that went out today, this overview of the book of Galatians, and I ask that you take it and plant it in every heart that heard it, Lord. Soften every heart by the leading of your Holy Spirit, by the oil and wine, Lord, of your love. Take every heart captive to a true salvation, to a born-again experience, and bring us all as a fellowship of believers through this sanctification process Father, where you, where your mighty hand, where the working of the Holy Spirit is, is moving in our hearts, sanctifying us and making us into the image of your Son. Lord, take us captive, lead us by your Holy Spirit. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.